Welcome to The Drummer and the Great Mountain, a podcast where we share effective tips and practices for working with adult ADD, ADHD in a natural, effective way without the use of medications. Each episode, join me, your host, Batman Saram, along with the author of The Drummer and the Great Mountain, Michael Joseph Ferguson. Join Michael and myself in an interactive discussion of sharing our stories as we journey together in transforming what can be the gift of being what we call hunter types. This podcast is intended to be your audio companion to the book written by Michael, who joins me each episode where we both will strive to foster dialogue, give you our personal insights, and share both of our experiences on this similar path that we are all on. Our intention and hope is that along with the book, this podcast gives you an additional perspective as you listen to us delve deeper into each chapter of the book to give you even more tools to go along with what it is that you are reading. Visit us at drummerandthegreatmountain.com to purchase the book and look for more tools, tips, and updates, as well as giving us feedback on this podcast. Join our growing global community of creative types, entrepreneurs, and out-of-the-box thinkers on our shared journey. Welcome to the Drummer and the Great Mountain Podcast. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. I'm your host, Michael Joseph Ferguson. On today's podcast episode, we are going to be discussing mindfulness. So we're going to be, that's a big topic. We're going to be talking about what does that mean specifically? It's something that gets talked about a lot. It's become more and more in the mainstream, but it's sometimes unclear what that is. So what is it exactly? Why practice mindfulness? How to practice it? And also, specifically, how does that support us as hunter types? What is the purpose for even exploring this in the first place? How is it going to support us in have overcoming our challenges, being uh, more fulfilled in our lives? How does mindfulness specifically support us? So we'll be talking about that. We'll have some exercises. Um, so stay tuned. So just one quick announcement, our next live weekly online support group starts March 10th. That's March 10th. I know many of you emailed us that couldn't make it into the live workshop uh, or have been in other groups and you've asked about this. So we're starting again March 10th. So if you're looking to connect with fellow hunter types and get support with integrating many of the things we talk about on this podcast, visit drummerinthegreatmountain.com forward slash group. That's drummerinthegreatmountain.com forward slash group. And at the end of this episode, I'll share more details about it. So today's topic is mindfulness. Now, this is something that I've been exploring mindfulness practices since probably 18 years old. It's been a long time. Um, and so I've gone through listening to a lot of uh, talks and going to workshops and doing a lot of practice of meditation. And over time, uh, I've watched it become more and more and more part of the mainstream. And specifically for us hunter types, mindfulness uh, and mindfulness practice is such a gift. In fact, I've said before, and I'll say it again, I think this entire podcast, as well as the book and my coaching, it's all about mindfulness. That is the core of what I do, is I want to support all of you, as well as in doing so, supporting myself and reminding myself how to become more mindful. And we'll talk a bit about why that's important and go into some specifics about it. So first off, I think we need to talk about the definition of mindfulness. Because even as I was before, as I was prepping for this podcast, I was looking up and listening to different people's definition of mindfulness. And it's, it's kind of all over the map. And so I want to give a very clear, specific definition of what I think what is classically considered mindfulness. And what I would define mindfulness is as it is present moment awareness. Mindfulness is present moment awareness. It's the process of cultivating that. So it is both a practice and it's also a muscle that you can build over time. So there, it's two pieces. So it is always 
ongoing and it, there's going to be times when you're strong in your mindfulness and you'll notice that that your ability to navigate the world because of it is easier and you're able to to move through things and that's often a result of having stronger mindfulness and on the inverse of that when that muscle is weak you you might find that some of your challenges become more pronounced so I gauge a lot of this in terms of mindfulness in building specifically that muscle of mindfulness. So we'll go into to some more into more depth in a bit about how to practice mindfulness. What does that look like? What does the terrain look like? But I want to start by just as I always do, like what why is this important to us? What what can how can this help us? And so specifically the challenges that us hunter types tend to face around specifically focus, impulsivity, completion, so building that habit of completion, memory, which is something we haven't really talked about a lot on this podcast, but it's definitely a challenge for many of us hunter types is forgetting things. So memory is definitely affected by mindfulness. Uh, Being caught by stimuli and addictive behaviors also very much is connected in with mindfulness, Uh, as well as time perception, because as we've talked about, the fluid perception of time, that's the challenge that we often face as hunter types is our what we thought would take X long did not. It took like exponentially longer or being able to plan ahead for things. So that is also can be greatly benefited through a mindfulness practice. And then overall, and I think the big one uh, is emotional stability. So specifically dealing with the meltdowns, the anger, uh, the unconscious reaction. And I, th- I want to highlight that for a spe- second because that's really at the core of what mindfulness aims to support is to bring yourself present so that you are not living in unconscious reactions to life. Because when you're in that space, you're not in choice. You're in a space where you're, you're reacting and you have, at that point, it's as you many of you know, when you're in that space where you've already in the middle of a meltdown, that is not the time necessarily to try to practice these, practice mindfulness, practice whatever it is. It's going to be way, way easier to identify what leads up to that space so you can have, you have way more traction on the lead up than you do when you're in it. When you're in it, yeah, it's great to have tools, but um, it's exponentially more effective to know what to do and what to focus on to prevent the ramp up happening in the first place. So those are the challenges that I think specifically mindfulness practice can support and uh, in some ways make huge differences, as I've seen with uh, coaching clients and people in our workshops, is that uh, mindfulness practice, f- again, supports can support focus. Uh, in terms of impulsivity, it's more mindfulness in terms of whether or not you go into the thing that you feel like, oh, wow, I look back and I have a regret. So mindfulness can support you in not being as impulsive, help you with your habit of completion, support you in your memory. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a bit. Uh, supports you in having some traction so you're not caught by stimuli and addictive behaviors. It brings you into the present moment, so time perception is supported through this as well, and then also greater emotional stability. So that's a lot of benefits for one type of practice. And so as we'll talk about, there's actually many ways you can practice mindfulness, but that's the reason. So as we continue on through this journey and you feel like, Oh, okay, well, why should I meditate? Which is one of the things that we'll talk about in the next episode. I will. This is going to be a two-parter. I'm going to talk about mindfulness in this episode. And the next episode will be specifically on meditation. And it's easy to get into a have to of like, oh, I should do this because if I don't do this, then, well, I'm supposed to do this. And, you know, my wife or my husband, you know, it it gets into this big have to and should thing. And then your motivation to do it reduces dramatically. Whereas if you can see the benefits and the joy and, and the greater fulfillment that you can get through your life through practicing mindfulness, then that is a much, to me, that's a much bigger carrot than just trying to fix myself. So um, I think that gives us a good terrain as to what mindfulness is um, and you know what is it what it is addresses inside us hunter types, what can it potentially make a difference in? 
And then let's continue on. Let's explore some in depth some of these pieces and how to more fully manifest a more mindful life. So let's explore a little bit more into the why. And I think one of the key purposes for doing, for practicing mindfulness is it gives you choice. It gives you more choice. So when you're in the present moment, so if mindfulness is the practice of bringing yourself back to the present moment, it puts you back in the driver's seat. So if you are an unconscious reaction, you are not driving your life. The unconscious reaction is driving your life. And many of us Our entire life is unconscious reaction, one thing after another, after another, and we feel completely out of control. And so if that is you, then please pay attention because mindfulness is a well-trodden road for many thousands of years. This is not new stuff. This has been around for a long time. Mindfulness can support that. In fact, I don't know what else could, to be honest. like Mindfulness is the way you get yourself back into the driver's seat. That is almost the definition of what mindfulness is. So if you're in the present moment, you're more likely to stop the train and get yourself into a place where you can have choice in that moment moment before the unconscious reaction kicks in. So if you're an unconscious reaction, then it will manifest in anxiety. You'll be like ruminating on the past and there might be anger and frustration or whatever else is coming from that space. Or you're in the future. You're thinking about what's happening or what's going to happen next, planning for the potential disaster that's going to happen from whatever the situation is, and that's going to be anxiety. So if you're anxious, you're thinking about something in the future. It's almost guaranteed. So all of that equates to, so that rumination of whatever happened in the past or the the anxiety of what's going to happen in the future, all of that can be put into a big ball called suffering. And so mindfulness practice brings you back to the present moment. So if you are in reaction, I want to go back to that. If you're in reaction, then specifically your past traumas, disappointments, hurts, everything that happened to you in the past all can color your present moment in a way where you don't see things as they are. It's putting a filter on the world around you, and this often limits us in seeing the opportunities that are available to us in the present moment. So I am 100% confident about that statement, because that is where many of us and possibly most of us live, is in this space where all of the past things that happened to us, all the things that were, they happened, there's a pain, there's some kind of emotional suffering or physical suffering. And then the way our brain works, which has kept us alive as a species for many thousands and thousands of years, is it looks, it says, okay, that happened in the past, that hurt. I don't want that to happen again. So the brain just goes off into the future and thinks about, here's how I'm going to keep that from happening again. So that is an unconscious mechanism, but that is a very strong survival instinct. The issue with that is, if there's not a way to turn that off, then you just stay in suffering. There's just everything that happened in the past as you've accumulated the baggage of suffering and emotional disappointments and all that, that's all going to color your present moment. So you're not able to actually see what's happening fully in the present moment. And more importantly, you don't, you're not experiencing the joy and fulfillment and the opportunities that are available to you. So mindfulness aims to turn that mechanism off in our brain. That is, it's a beautiful mechanism. It, it's kept us alive. It's not bad. So it's it, when often when we talk about meditation and you'll hear the term ego and what is our ego? Our ego is in a sense that mechanism. So if you can build your this muscle of mindfulness, then you have ability to stop that train for a moment. Maybe it's just a fraction of a second, but over time as you practice mindfulness, that your ability gets stronger and stronger to come back to the present moment, stop that train, stop that mechanism from unconsciously just kicking in and overriding everything that's happening in the present moment, and you have choice again. Cuz then then if you have that muscle developed, then something comes up and you're able to take a breath, 
process the situation and see it clearly as it is in this moment versus completely colored by all of that past momentum of emotional hurt, pain, or, you know, positives. There could be, you could be going into a situation with um, too much confidence and where you actually need to be mindful that, oh, I need to actually pull back a little bit and be a little bit more present because maybe there is a danger here that I need to be aware of. That's also the other side of it. So it's not just the the negative things that happened in the past. It's often, it can potentially be all the, some positive things that happened where you're like, oh, okay. And you have, you're overconfident. And I know many of us hunter types tend to get into that place of overconfidence. And then later on, we have regret. And then we have the pain of the regret. And then that colors the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. So I think you get the point. The point is, if you're mindful and you have this muscle, then you have at least some ability to stop that train. And so continuing on with the why, it's greater peace, greater fulfillment, because you're fully in the moment. So you're able to treasure and savor the moment. So such a key piece of this is mindfulness gives you a greater ability to savor the present moment. You don't know how long you're going to be here. So if you have a family or you have friends, like you don't know how long you can think you know how long. But if you're constantly in the moment or constantly in the next moment, in the next moment, five years down the road, 10 years down the road in your thoughts, then you're not savoring what's in front of you because that doesn't exist. Whatever the thought is of the future, it's not here. That's not real. That's just something that's going on in your head, whereas life is happening in this present moment. So if you have the strength and you've built the muscle to stop and be present, then your ability then to savor and to fully live life fully and enjoy the, the subtleties and the richness of life in the present moment Um, that's just a better life. So greater peace, greater fulfillment, less likely to do something you'll regret is a really big piece of mindfulness. And so, and let's go into some of the, the specifics that I mentioned earlier. So it affects memory. So if you're having a challenge with memory and forgetting things, part of that, maybe you're just never in the present moment. So if you set your keys down, you forget where you put your keys because it's because you weren't in that moment. You were somewhere else. Like if you were just in that moment and you set the keys down and you stopped for a second and said, I just placed my keys there, that little sentence, I said, I'd like that just brought you back to the present moment. Your likelihood of remembering where your keys are go goes way up. Um, so again, mindfulness, present moment awareness, and we'll talk about some specific techniques that will support that. In a, in a second, but it definitely affects your mood. And the more mindful you can be, the more you have an ability to not just be ruled by your emotions. And in me, numerous studies have been done for people that with people that have meditated, have practiced mindfulness for a long time. Their overall baseline of joy and peace is so much greater than the rest of us. It's this is not. This is not speculative at this point. There's been enough actually scientific studies that have gone into mindfulness practice to say, yes, this absolutely does work. So focus is an easy one to note in terms of mindfulness practice. Your focus level will go up if you practice mindfulness, period. Your ability to focus during the day will increase if you have a daily mindfulness practice. Now, the trick is, how do you keep that practice going? That, for hunter types, that's what we'll talk about in a second. That's the, that's the thing, right? It's like keeping yourself, well, it's like keeping up with a meditation practice. That feels like insurmountable. How do I do that? I can barely, you know, take the trash out every week. So these are the things we'll talk about. We have to have, a, there's a toolkit for us hunter types that we need to have to know how to approach approach mindfulness practice. Um, And as I stated, this is a muscle that you can build over time. So it is like anything else. If the more you do it, the better you get at it, the stronger the muscle becomes, the, the greater ability you have to pull yourself back to the present moment, which again, I just want to keep coming back to the definition. Mindfulness is the ability to bring yourself back to the present moment. It is present moment awareness. So how do you do it? So let's talk about what what are some of the practices that can help you with your mindfulness. So the classic is meditation. That is 
proven. It's 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 studies have been done on it. People have lived those lived that out through their lives, and they've they've proven that mindfulness can be built and developed and strengthened through the practice of meditation. So I'm not going to go into the specifics of meditation in this episode. So the next episode, I'm going to actually go into specific practices, how to do it, how to build that practice up as a hunter type. But in general, meditation is one, it definitely, so it sits inside of mindfulness. So it's present moment awareness. Yes. And going that next level, it is typically some kind of practice where there's a one pointed awareness. So it's either your breath or it's a sensation in your body. It is within a time frame. As a practice, it's usually developed as I'm going to do this practice for X amount of minutes as a method of building that muscle of mindfulness. Um, So connected to that is mindful breathing. So that is a particular kind of mindfulness that you could consider a meditation as well. So, But that can happen throughout the day. So that doesn't necessarily have to be a traditional sitting down in lotus position, focusing on your breath. Mindful breathing can be happening every single moment of your day. And when you find yourself lost in thought and spinning out on this or that, you can say, okay, wait a minute, let's bring my attention back to my breath. And maybe you bring your awareness just to the the in and out of your breath. And as a meditation practice, then you go very specific. So Uh, A classic meditation practice is you bring your awareness to the tip of your nose where exactly where the air is coming in and going out. And you don't follow the air in, you don't follow it out. You just bring your attention right to the point of awareness, right where it's coming in and going out. So that is a classic mindful breathing exercise, but it doesn't have to be that specific. And if you look online and type in mindful breathing, there is YouTube videos and blog articles. So this is a whole area of mindfulness that you can practice. Mindful speech is another one that is very important. So that's a little more general, but I I think it's important to talk about. So I talk about nonviolent communication and needs-based awareness, and that is being present in the moment of what is coming out of your mouth. That is clearly a mindfulness practice, because if you are just unconsciously spewing things out of your mouth all day long, which most of us do, then, you know, odds are one or two of those things that are going to come out are going to are going to bite you later. Right. You're going to connect. You're going to trigger somebody um, or you're just going to reaffirm all the negativity that um, you don't want to reaffirm. Right. We've talked about this in other podcasts where being mind the Havez quote of what we speak becomes the house we live in. That's that's it. That is that is the situation. Like your whole life is a cre- is often created through like it starts with a thought, then you speak it, right? And then once that's spoken into existence, then your life starts to reflect that. And so one of the great part places where you have traction is to become more mindful of what is coming out of your mouth. So you take a breath and go, how am I going to express myself in this moment? Again, cl- very clearly a mindfulness practice. Um, we'll talk in, in future episodes about affirmations, and that's another form of mindful speech. It's like, how are you? It's mindful speech, mindful thought. Uh, how are you? What is the, you have this thought stream going on in your head? Affirmations are a method by which you, you, you insert yourself into your thought stream. And you say, these are the thoughts I choose to think because I like the effect they have. This is the direction I would like to go with my life, even though I don't feel it in the moment. Maybe I can't fully get behind this affirmation, but I'm going to speak that thought or at least think that thought or write that thought because I choose to think that that's going to move me in the direction I want to go versus the stream of thoughts of negativity that I don't want to be completely dominating my life. So mindful speech, is it's definitely connected in with that. Another one's mindful eating. So again, another topic we discuss continually on this podcast. What are you putting inside of your body? Are you present in the moment when you're eating? The Another traction place where we have traction in our lives is just, are we constantly, unconsciously just sitting and eating and talking and there's just no present moment awareness. You're not really enjoying your food. You're eating your food. And so if you're in that mode, 
all the time, then one, you're not enjoying one of the great pleasures of life, which is food. So um, when you when some people argue for like, oh, you know, I like pastries and all that, I'm like, okay, great. Bring yourself fully present to that experience then. Enjoy it fully. Um, if, you, if it's hard for you to um, move past some foods that may be creating some challenges for you in other ways, then just bring yourself fully present to that savoring of that. And often, especially with sweets and things that are hyper sweet, where they've got a lot of extra things put in there, especially the um, refined sugars, you, you may start to think, oh, wow, this is actually like too sweet. And wow, my teeth hurt a little bit. Like you start to become aware of the full process instead of the sort of unconscious um, habitual process that many of us are getting into. And, you know, that's the other thing is w with transforming um, even f types of food addiction, that mindfulness is such a key piece of that. Because if you're present with your food, then you might go, oh, I can stop. Like there, your, your ability to maybe stop yourself or to reach for that thing that maybe you don't really want to eat. If you build this muscle of mindfulness up, you will have a greater ability to stop yourself as well as to fully enjoy what you're eating. Uh, other types of mindfulness practice, um, we talk just going back to mindfulness of your emotions. So being fully present with what's emotionally alive in you in this moment. So something happens and there's a trigger. And if you have mindfulness to what's happening inside you in that moment, you're going to have choice. Whereas if you have, you've not cultivated mindfulness, you will just go into reaction. So this goes into why I love nonviolent communication and needs-based awareness because it touches at the core of how we function as human beings. That when we can name the need that is alive in the present moment that's connected to an emotion that's really strong, then we have an ability to have choice in that moment instead of lashing out or choosing to feel offended or whatever the situation is. And you have greater control over your life. You, you, you're going to circumvent things that could have potentially caused you a lot of suffering because you've cultivated a certain level of mindfulness. So uh, I would encourage you, if that's really alive for you hearing this, I would go back and Google or uh, go into our drummerinthegreatmountain.com, go to podcasts, look at our journaling episode. We got a lot of positive feedback from that episode. And I talk all about that. I talk about like how, what are needs, how to work with your needs, how do emotions arise, and how do you use journaling as a tool, a mindfulness tool to connect with what's alive in you in the moment. And it's kind of the training wheels. Like journaling is something you can do all the time, anywhere, pretty much. And it builds that muscle of awareness of like, I can name the emotions that are alive. Like just being able to name them. Most people, I think, I think even guys more than women, I just over a general, generally speaking, we have a harder time understanding our emotions. We have less of a, 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 a language for emotions. And that actually puts us in a disadvantage. And so when we journal and we can discipline ourselves to say, what am I actually feeling in this moment? that gives us connection to that life force inside of us. And then we can make a decision instead of going into reaction or just staying in that, that loop, that head loop of reaction of like, okay, I'm just, that happened. And then this is how I respond. That doesn't give you much choice. So journaling is a mindfulness practice by, by which you get become aware of your emotions. You can, you can process through them so that you don't have to process them with another person specifically unconsciously and then have to then clean that up later. So other practices um, are mindful walking. So uh, you can often, um, if you can, and I've mentioned this before, you can look up walking meditation, just go to YouTube, look that up. Lots of videos on walking meditation it is literally just being fully present in the moment with the act of moving through the world. You can do it with exercise. So it's mindful movement maybe would be a better term for it. And so for many of us, this is maybe where we start, because maybe exercise for you may be a lot easier than sitting quietly in meditation. Maybe that's just too much to ask in the moment. Then maybe mindful movement is really where you want to put your focus then. So in, underneath that is like martial arts fits into that category. Um Tai Chi, Qigong specifically are really two really mindfulness-based practices. Um, 
yoga is clearly mindful movement, especially if when it comes to more active yoga practices, that is clearly mindful movement. Moving on from mindful movement, there's also just mindful sitting. So that's classic meditation practice. Um, that kind of fits in there where you're just literally in the moment and you could just literally be body awareness. You're just, I'm sitting in this moment. Thoughts come and you come back to your physical body. You're just in your body. You just take, you can even do this right now. Just take a moment, wherever you're at, you're driving, um, you're walking, you're moving, just become aware of your physical body. Just become aware of it. If you're, there's thoughts that are happening in your head, but come back. Like, how do your, how do your fingers feel right now? How do your legs feel? How do your feet feel? You've probably been ignoring them all day and they're there. They're always here. That sensation, that, that present moment, your body is always in the present moment. So your head is the, your, your mental process is the only thing that can technically uh, go into the future, but your body is right here. Your hands, how are you feeling? Maybe for many of us, when we're, we start to become aware of our physical body, we start to say, oh, wow, I've got these pain, like I, I've been holding my shoulders this way and that really hurts. And, and you're not aware, you're not embodied, you're not physically in this moment. So mindful sitting, mindfulness of your physical body, that is definitely, a that's in it of itself is a mindfulness practice. And again, it brings you back to the present moment. So those are some types in general. Um, and what I'd like to go into now is specifically, what does it look like to have practices? Like what are the practices you can start? How, you know, if you're going to build a muscle, they're not, it's the thought, it's a not enough. It's not enough to just think, oh, I want to, I want to get my pecs stronger, and you know, you don't. That's not going to be enough. You have to have some kind of practice that you're going to do regularly that's going to build that muscle up. Um, so, first thing that I've noticed a lot when um, both with coaching and also in our workshops is it's really easy to get into the mindset of have to. It's like, okay, now this is what's supposed to be helpful to me, so I should do this. I have to do this, and. It, as soon as that switch of have to gets flipped, it just triggers that hunter type tendency of just like, I don't want to do it. <laughs> right? It's like we're more, we're not practically driven people. We're driven by what inspires us, what engages us. And so don't fight against that. So if you find yourself like feeling, like, oh, I have to meditate, I have to do this, then you got to stop yourself and go, you're doing it wrong. You need to come back to your natural tendencies and find your way through uh, in a way that is engaging to you. So the good news about mindfulness practices is there's a lot of different ways to build mindfulness. So you don't have to just lock yourself into, I have to sit and meditate every morning or else I'm not doing it right. So let's, ex so to begin with, and I want you to start thinking in terms uh, now of like application and how this may relate to things that you choose to do this coming week. So the first one, of course, is meditation. And we'll just say from the classical sense, which is sitting quietly, comfortable seated position, uh, maybe cross-legged, comfortable and spine erect and that you are um, the easiest way in if you're new to meditation is find a guided meditation that's usually the easiest way to do it um, so that could be uh, like I mentioned uh, I believe it I mentioned earlier insight timer is really great that's a really good app to check out that's got a lot of guided meditations on it um, get onto YouTube YouTube's got a lot of things that you can search and explore um, or join a group. See if there's a group nearby you. Most of you have meditation groups near you. Go to Meetup, do some searches online, see if you can find a group near you. Uh, often a, a yoga center will typically have meditation classes there as well. Martial arts. So the two key martial arts that I would, I would look at are Tai Chi and Qigong. So Qigong is spelled Q-I and then G-O-N-G. Qigong. Those are two you may want to explore because they're very much focused on mindfulness and mindful movement. Now, in the category of mindful movement, yoga is definitely probably the most accessible form, especially in the West, uh, because it has become so dominant here. Uh, it's probably the easiest for you to access either online or in person. 
ideally in person because you'll just get a deeper, richer experience. You'll be, it'll, it's less pressure for you to have your own self-discipline to get yourself to do it. If you're in a class, it's typically easier. I would encourage you to go to a class. So yoga is classic mindful movement. And a good yoga teacher will also integrate mindful um, breath into the practice. And then at the end of a yoga practice, typically there's something called shavasana, which is where you're lying still quietly. And that is a meditation practice in and of itself. So mindful movement, uh, martial arts, yoga, those are two things that you can easily access and explore and with the intention of it being a mindfulness practice, because you can explore it just as a movement practice, and that's great, but if your mind's in a thousand different places and you don't have the framework that this is actually a mindfulness practice, then you actually won't build that muscle as strongly as you would if you had that intention going into it. Connected to that is just exercise, movement, walking, running, Anything that you're doing at the gym, if you integrate those as a mindfulness practice where you're focusing on your breath, you're being fully present in your body as you're doing them, that is a mindfulness practice. As opposed to, and which is, and this is not wrong to do this, but that as opposed to listening to music, uh, your thoughts are in a thousand different places and you're moving. Sometimes that's an easy way into doing that because it engages us enough that we we can motivate ourselves to do it. The next level of that is actually you are being fully present with that experience. You're not listening to other things other than the environment around you. And you're using that experience as a mindfulness practice. So you, you may just say, okay, I'm, I'm running right now. I'm focusing on the feet, my feet. I'm feeling where my feet actually touch the earth and I'm fully present in this moment. And so you can see the difference. So you could do the same activity without mindfulness or you can do that activity with mindfulness. And when you do add the mindfulness component to it, you're building that muscle. So moving on to mindful eating. So we're all every day we're eating, we're drinking, we're drinking our fluids, we're eating food, that whole practice, like when you're doing that, that can be a mindfulness practice. So what does that look like? Uh, so again, if you, you can find many references to mindful eating online. So I encourage you to go into do your own research, but basically it's avoiding eating unconsciously. So it's the what it could potentially look like is instead of you blasting the radio, talking to someone else, and then putting food in your mouth, you stop and at least one meal, let's just say one meal a day, it would be the challenge. You sit quietly, you remove the distractions, and you're fully present with the process of eating. You're eating the food, you're, you're savoring the food, you're fully being present with one of the great joys in life sitting and being grateful in that moment for what you're about to eat, that you have food to eat. There's so many people in the world that don't have that. That's the reality. That's not a concept. That's real. They don't have good food to eat. They don't have clean water. You should be, there's a, bringing your awareness to the gratitude that you have it in the moment can just bring more fulfillment to you in that moment, whatever drama is happening in your life. Your process of being mindful when you're eating and being grateful for that can, can quiet your mind down for a second, give you perspective in that moment and relieve suffering, right? That's, that's, that would be a key uh, benefit from doing this. So then, and then as you're eating, being present with the process of eating, being present with the joy and the savoring of the food so that you're, when you're eating, you know that you're, you're, you're fully present in the moment with that experience. You may close your eyes. You may have some, something that like really, and it could be a transformational experience for many people because most of the time we're on autopilot. And then we also may feel like, oh, I just, I don't like this food. <laughs> that might be one of the revelations. This doesn't taste very good. And that may lead you to making other decisions on what you eat uh, or more in tune with what your body is actually telling you it needs because your body will give you cues and cravings for food that that are that have nutrients and things that you may be lacking in and and if you're not mindfulness of mindful of those cravings then um you know these are things that we've been over time especially i'd say the last 200 years 
of humanity, we've lost lost touch with being good animals, of like tuning into it. Animals are tuned in. They know what to eat, when to eat it, because they're they're hundred percent in that experience. Where for us, we can get very conceptual in our heads. And if we're tuned into what our body needs, I think women tend to be a little more tuned in than men in, in general, especially, I mean, you can give the classic example of when a woman becomes pregnant, her cravings change and she's they're stronger and clearer, so they're easier to touch in some ways. But we all have that. We all have a, a mechanism inside ourselves that is, vol- is evolved with everything else in nature that tells us what we're needing and what we're not needing. And we can completely override that when we're in an an unconscious frame of mind. So mindful eating, sitting quietly, making it a ritual, reducing the distractions, and being fully present in the moment. That is the one opportunity you can use, even if it's just one time a day, to bring you back to the present moment. Uh, One other one I want to offer that I've mentioned before is journaling. And I'll put a link to the journaling uh, episode in the description of this podcast. So two ways of going about journaling as a mindfulness practice. One, you're journaling to to connect in with your present feelings and needs. What is alive for you right now emotionally? This is something I highly encourage for all of us hunter types. It's one of those key tools that um, I think you're doing yourself a disservice not to explore it because it has such a, a key benefit specifically for us hunter types to get really in touch with what's alive emotionally so we can make clear decisions on what would make things better instead of staying in that unconscious state. So I just, I'll check out that link, check out that podcast. If you haven't listened to it already, I go very uh, into detail as well as there's a worksheet for that particular episode. Um, The second method of journaling could be just gratitudes, which is literally taking five minutes and writing down all the things that you feel grateful for in the moment. What do you have? What is it? What do you have in your life? There's a thousand things that are wrong, right? We, you, you're constantly dwelling on them all the time. So that's handled. You already got that handled. That's the rest of the, the rest of your life is handled thinking about that. What you, most of us don't have is a practice by which we stop, tune in and state and write down and become mindful, fully mindful, not just writing it down because like, oh, that's an idea. Like, what are you really, really grateful for in your life? What are the things that are going well? What are the things that you have versus the things, there's an unlimited amount of things you don't have. There's a finite thing, amount of things that you do have. So what are those? How do, you, how do you name those and be present with those? And so that would be another form of journaling is just journaling the gratitudes. What are you grateful for? Not just to do it because it's a good thing and, and it's la la la. It's it's like this nice woo woo thing that we do to make ourselves feel better. It's it's a real practice. It's a practice that brings you back to the present moment and turns off that mechanism of wanting the next thing and the next thing and the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. It is a surefire method of bringing you back to the present moment. So. That is a list. That's a pretty, I think that's a pretty decent list to work from as a menu. There's plenty more of mindful, plenty more mindfulness practice. That is a limited list. So please go out, explore. In the next episode, I'm going to go into some specific uh, meditation practices that connect in with mindfulness, and t- including um, tuning into your senses and um, especially being in nature. There's a meditation practice that has come out of um, the, what would you call it, the um, nature awareness field, which has been passed down from um, hunter-gatherer tradition. So I want to share that one with you because it really connects with that hunter-type tendency that we have. Uh, and our distractibility. So that'll be a meditation I'll share in the next episode. So that's the menu. And so what I would encourage you to do is pick one, at least one, Don't pick too many because then you'll just have too many things. Explore at least one of those items or some other form of mindfulness practice going into this coming week. Commit to just testing that one out. Don't have a big heavy like, okay, I got to do this three days in a row. Don't even do that. Just say, I'm going to explore this as new terrain that you haven't explored yet. It's, it's an adventure. You're going to test it out. You may want to, if it's meditation, maybe you listen to a bunch of talks on meditation. Maybe that's just the inspiration you need even before sitting down and meditating. For me, I like learning all about something and then I can, I can more fully engage with it. So I definitely encourage you to do that. If you just want to listen to 
talks on mindfulness and research and just get more information this week, then do that. That's a really good use of your time because chances are that inspiration will lead to a practice and then you can start testing it out. But I would encourage you, if you go down that road of just testing and exp- like researching, at least take one moment to practice whatever it is you're researching. Pick one thing and go into that practice for five to 10 minutes. Okay, so then what does it look like to have a mindful day? What is, what is a daily mindfulness, like a realistic, I want to put it this way, because I mean, you could go into uh, some of the Buddhist traditions where you're, they sit for eight hours at a time. I mean, that's, that, that is a mindful, that's a hyper mindful day, but we're not there yet. That's, that's, like, that's a practice that's out of reach for most of us, right? So, but what we can do is integrate some of these practices into our day to day in a way that feels fluid and actually supports us in having a better day, having more traction on our day, having more choice in our day. So the goal is, coming back to the definition of mindfulness, is being more present, building the muscle of present moment awareness. So at the start of your day, what this could look like is before all of the distractions and the busyness of the day kicks in, you start the day with some kind of mindfulness practice or a series of mindfulness practices. So to begin with, it might be a five to 10 minute meditation practice. So the simplest way to do that would be um, use an app like Insight Timer. That's a really good one. A lot of people use that one. Uh, You maybe find something on YouTube and you have some other app. There's tons of apps that have guided meditations. Or even better is you have you and your companion sit down and agree to, to spend five to 10 minutes in meditation together. And maybe you also use an app or something to lead you in the beginning of it. But actually having another person to meditate with can be really helpful in grounding the practice. So um, if you can bring someone else into it, if not, then have some kind of meditation practice that, um, that can, you can be guided through. And then over time, ideally, you get to the place where you get a practice, you know what that practice is, and then you're able to just do it on your own. That's the ideal. Like eventually, over time, you use the app as a crutch. And then over time, you get to the point where you've built a meditation practice that feels good to you. And then you sit quietly by yourself and do it. So meditation is an option. Sitting meditation is an option. It doesn't have, you don't have to do that. So that's one option though. So another option could be you journal, which is you journal your feelings and needs. As I was talking about earlier, I used that episode to give you an idea of how to do that or your gratitude journal. That could be that you could do meditation journaling and that or meditation journaling and combine those together or um, you just do journaling. The other thing you could do is exercise any kind of mindful movement in the morning, like yoga, Tai Chi, Qigong, all the things that I just talked about, or getting outside and doing some kind of exercise where you're bringing mindfulness into it. That is like all of those could be part of your morning mindfulness practice. So you pick and choose and play with that. Pick one and start working with it. And then maybe you stack other ones as you go along. So then once you've done that, so just kind of look back to what the day could look like before the busyness of the day kicks in, maybe you then take a moment to plan your day. So your brain is going to be in a better space after a mindfulness practice for you to do your daily planning. And again, once you've had, uh, you start to cultivate this muscle of mindfulness, your ability to plan is going to improve. You'll be able to prioritize better. You'll have a greater awareness. Whereas had you just sat down and you're stressed and you're anxious and there's all these things and your mind's over here and your mind's over there, that's what makes planning really difficult. It's that state of mind that's most challenging. And what can help is some kind of mindfulness practice and movement and or movement is going to help you sit down and do that process. So what I usually recommend for my clients and the people in our workshops is start the day with some kind of mindfulness practice and or exercise then do some kind of daily planning. And I've gone into that in previous episodes where I talk about doing a mind map and going through and kind of getting things out of your head, doing a brain dump, 
writing things down, prioritizing, and then putting it on your calendar. That's This is the time of day to do it. Before the day kicks in and there's a lot of chaos and people and you got to engage, try to get your practice and your morning ritual in place before all that stuff happens. I know it's difficult for many of you because you have families and it's just not easy to do that. Then maybe you have to wait until maybe after you drop your kids off before you go to work. Maybe that's the window that you have. So Play with it, but see if you can have some kind of mindfulness practice in the morning to start your day, to bring yourself fully into the present moment. Then midday, th- this is how mindfulness practice can come in. You can have, so during lunch, mindful eating during lunch. You're actually using your eating, your your lunch experience as a practice to bring you back to the present moment. Again, it's always the process of coming back to this moment. This is all the actions happening right here. In, but we're mostly, most of us are usually in the past or in the future. If we're in the moment, that's uh, one of my friends <laughs> always says, must be present to win. And I think that's my shout out to you, Jeff. I know you're a listener to the podcast. One of my favorite expressions. I th- I haven't heard anyone else say that one towards mindfulness. And I think that's just a great expression. Must be present to win. So mindfulness as you're eating lunch is a, is a method by which you can bring yourself back to the present moment. And then after lunch, then maybe you do a short meditation. That's really common for a lot of of my coaching clients. They get into the habit of like, okay, lunch happens. It's something that happens generally at the same time. If it doesn't, then it just goes into your nutrition and all these other pieces that as you start to build the mindfulness practice, it could potentially improve your nutrition and your exercise because you're just more present and remembering the the intentions that you've set for yourself. So maybe a short meditation, five, 10 minutes, it doesn't have to be a long meditation. And then connected with that could be going back to journaling. What's alive in you in this moment? Check in with yourself. How are you feeling right now? And again, coming back to the present moment, use the journaling exercise that I talk about in that podcast to bring you back. And then added to that, I think, and as important is, how do you want the rest of your day to go? What is the intention that you're setting for yourself for the rest of your day? Most of us never set intentions. We feel like we're completely, our life feels completely out of control. And we don't feel like, one, either the intentions matter or have any impact, or two, that we don't even think to do it. But if you state an intention to yourself, I would like this day to go like this for the rest of the day the odds are probably better than normal that your your day is going to go better. Your day's chances are will go better just by you stating that intention for yourself. And it comes back to how much control do you have over your life? And for if you have more mindfulness, I would say from my experience, the control of your life increases. You have more an ability to state what you want and get it. And that's what we all want. That's the thing. Like we want to know that if we 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 want something that we can get it. I mean, that's sort of like the fulfillment, that's the mechanism. And if you can state an intention for what you want and how your day you'd like your day to go, as you're in the present moment, the odds of you getting that increase. That's that would and I I would dare you to test that out and prove me wrong, and if you and if, but if you're not in the present moment and you're always in reaction, you'll never have the awareness to state your intention for the rest of the day. So that's midday, uh, and as you go towards the afternoon and evening, maybe you're, you have an exercise routine. That's when I usually have mine towards the end of the day. Um, that's that's part of your mindfulness practice, and then in the evening. Um, here's a a potential ritual that you can explore. So one would be during dinner, mindfulness around eating. That's brings you back to the present moment. Again, you're aware of being, and also if you're with family and, and there's a lot going on, one, you can pull them in and say, let's do this as an experiment. Let's sit quietly and eat presently. I'm sure that will go over well. (laughs) Some families, they're like, "Ah, I don't want to do that. So, uh, but maybe so you be, maybe you'll, you'll be surprised. Maybe there'll be a sense of like, Oh, okay. Maybe it's just two minutes. Maybe it's a minute or two of silence just as you're starting to sit down and eat. And then you guys talk. Whatever it is, how do you use your dinner as some kind of mindfulness practice? Then after dinner, which you may consider doing is going for a quiet walk. Maybe you go by yourself. Maybe you go with your family or go with your spouse. Um, And again, mindful movement, mindful breathing. 
bringing you back to the present moment. And then maybe you reflect on the day and you come back and you do like a short journaling. Again, checking back in with yourself. How are you feeling right now? Not as a have to, not as like, oh, I should do this because Michael said so, or, it, you know, this will improve my ADHD. It's none of that. It's because it brings you more joy to do this than not do it. And then so tied in with that, um, many of you who went through this workshop and through previous workshops know that I like tracking, especially as you're testing new things out. So maybe you do your tracking sheet at that point. Like what was your mood throughout the day? What was your focus level? What was your productivity level? Did you have any meltdowns? Like doing that kind of tracking. Um, I've shared that tracking sheet in previous episodes. If you don't have one, it's also in the book. Uh, drop me an email. I'll make sure you get it. I can't remember which episode I shared that with. It was sometime last year. So happy to share that with you. It's available as a PDF. And then before bed, maybe some kind of meditation practice. Maybe you, again, pull in your spouse or your boyfriend or your girlfriend, and you guys sit down together and do a five to 10 minute meditation. Again, using some kind of app or some kind of guided meditation or if you have a practice already in place, maybe you do that. Maybe do mindful movement in terms of yoga and a breathing practice. And there's a good chance you're actually your dreams may be better. You may actually sleep better at night because you uh, because you meditate and you did yoga. There's studies that have shown that that if you do that kind of practice before bed, it can often help insomnia issues. Or or for us, the issue for most of us with sleep is distractions. It's when our dopamine ebb is at our lowest, so we're most open to distractions. So things are more, we'll stay up late, we'll stay engaged with something, especially on our phones or watching a movie or something like that. And then we, we wake up and then we don't sleep good. And then going back to mindfulness, our, that day after when you don't get enough sleep usually is less than mindful. And so that's that reaction state. If you can, if you get into habits like that, then you're always reacting because you're tired and then you're reacting to the day because you're not functioning well. And then it's been, so to break that habit up, good night's sleep, eating well, exercise, some kind of mindfulness practice. That is the way to break that pattern up so you can get back into the driver's seat again and have some awareness of how to create your day mindfully, mindfully instead of just being pulled along by it. So I hope that was helpful to you. Uh, we covered a lot of ground, so be sure to check the description of this podcast. I'll include a number of links uh, to what we discussed on the podcast so you can continue your research into mindfulness practices. And as a reminder, next episode, we will be specifically talking about meditation and some specific meditation practices that I've found can be really supportive for us hunter types. So as a reminder, our next live weekly online support group starts March 10th, March 10th. Uh, and so just a brief background of what we do. Uh, these are weekly video conference uh, sessions, so you can access it from anywhere in the world. And we basically follow the same basic structure I use with my coaching clients. So this is your opportunity to connect with fellow hunter types, get the support you need to integrate the tools that we discussed on this podcast. Um, and I think more than anything, it's going to give perhaps give you some much needed empathy for the challenges that it that we tend to have as hunter types. Um, so we'll be discussing the practical tools and support towards things like time management and mindful scheduling, follow through, exercise and nutrition, tools like journaling and tracking, a number of the things that we talked about today. Uh, and primarily it's connection with community. So uh, for those of you who may have you don't have a lot of people in your life that can actually understand what it's like to be to have your challenges, then this is a really good sounding board for you uh, and also can potentially create some accountability for the follow through on your goals. So you can access the meeting wherever you are in the world. We use Zoom meetings or you can just phone in. Uh, we do the calls on Tuesdays, 3 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, and then after we also make the recordings available. So if you can't make all the sessions, you have access to all of the recordings. Um, 
And then there's also a discussion forum that you will have access to as well. So it's a whole bunch of things wrapped into one. So if you're interested, check out uh, drummerinthegreatmountain.com forward slash group. And I also want to quickly thank all of you who joined us in our last Alive workshop. It was such a pleasure con- to connect with all of you. What an amazing group. You guys were so supportive of each other. I was just, I'm always thoroughly impressed with the empathy and depth of the people in our our podcast audience. So it was just such a great pleasure to join all of you. Thank you all so much. I will stay connected with you in the, uh, the, in the Facebook group. And I'm wishing you all a very, very fruitful and nourishing 2020. So that's it. So until next time, be well. Thanks for joining us. If you'd like to learn more about the book, The Drummer in the Great Mountain, visit drummerinthegreatmountain.com. To join us on social media, click the links at the top of the homepage. Help us spread the word. We're a small press and reviews really help. If you've been enjoying the podcast or the book, consider writing a review on iTunes, Amazon, Goodreads, or your podcast app. If you're new to the podcast and want to quickly get up to speed on the concepts we discuss, check out our free five-day mini course. Visit drummerinthegreatmountain.com forward slash mini course. If there's a topic you'd like us to cover on future episodes, we'd love to hear from you. Please send us an email at info at drummerinthegreatmountain.com.